Uh, next talk uh, coming from Yale, it, Yale M. Bears uh, uh, on reoccurring magnetic field anomalies in the South Atlantic and the first paleo intensities uh, from St. Helena. Yeah, let me just share my screen. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, and we can see your screen as well. Awesome. And my pointer, everything ready. Um, so thank you. My name is Yael English. Uh, <laughs> And I want to discuss uh, the South Atlantic anomaly or the recurrence of, South, uh, of irregular behavior in the field in the South Atlantic. And with that, the first paleo intensity is coming from St. Helena, which is the blue star on this global field strength uh, figure. Um, see. So first, uh, a little recap of today's magnetic field, which is not a perfect dipole. Uh, in this figure, you can see the field strength from IGRF-12 from 2015, where you can clearly see a weakness in the South Atlantic, which we call the South Atlantic anomaly. Um, this anomaly leads to irregular uh, behavior at St. Helena, which is this blue star, where, for instance, the declination is almost 17 degrees off, and the intensity is 29 microtesla, where we would expect almost 34 microtesla for a GAD field. So, a dipole field. Why is this uh, anomalous feature so important and talked about so often? Uh, well, for instance, our satellites get, um, uh, get damaged because the magnetic field doesn't protect them as well as they should in the South Atlantic. But for us geophysicists and geologists, it's more important to discuss the link between the anomalous behavior of the field and the lowermost mantle features. Uh, which was done by John Tordino in 2015. Uh, Tordino and others published data, new data from South Africa, saying that the South Atlantic anomaly was longer lived than thought before, and they linked it to the steep edge of this uh, large low shear velocity province, or LSVP, under, South uh, under Africa, which they say causes this reverse flux patch in the field on the core mental boundary, then causing the South Atlantic anomaly or anomalous features in the field. Other study, uh, studies suggest that the South Atlantic anomaly and the overall weakening of the field might be a precursor of the whole field reversing, which obviously is also very interesting to all geologists and especially paleomagnetists. Um, and if this South Atlantic uh, irregular behavior is actually a very long lived feature, does it interfere with the hypothesis, hypothesis of a geocentral actual dipole. Um, these are some reasons of the many publications that came out in the last couple of years, uh, showing here with, for my personal highlight, <laughs> our paper this summer uh, in PNAS with the directional data from St. Helena, uh, saying that in fact, there was irregular behavior in the South Atlantic on a million year time scale when looking at directions from St. Helena. So why do we look at St. Helena? Well, all these other studies that I showed in the previous slide talk about last 300,000 years maximum. But when we talk about time average field, we preferably want to look at at least 10 million years, um, which is also why we looked at this uh, data set that was published by Cromwell and others um, in 2018, discussing all the paleo secular variation data from the past 10 million years which we used to compare our direction from directions from St. Helena with. Uh, and St. Helena is a volcanic island that has rocks from between the ages of eight and a half and 11 million years old. So a quick recap of uh, the directional study that we published this summer. Um, we performed directional uh, paleo directions on about 50 sites. And here are all the results in this equal area plot, uh, which we then uh, turned into virtual geomagnetic poles. And those virtual geomagnetic poles were uh, quite scattered, even though they averaged out to this uh, pole that comes quite close to the geographic hole, the dispersion is very high, which is 21.9 degrees, which we then compared to all the other data uh, in this plot in, from PSV10, so that 10 million year old, uh, 10 million year uh, database, um, where this red star is our dispersion from St. Helena which clearly is an outlier and doesn't follow this 
beautiful trend that shows the latitudinal dependence of the dispersion. So with that, we said the irregular field in the South Atlantic is actually occurring on a million year time scale based on these directions. Um, but now we want to talk about the paleo intensities from this same island. So first we go back to this island where we went on field work, uh, Andy Biggin and I, in January 2018. Uh, it's a beautiful island which is circled here on this map. It's about 2000 kilometers west of Africa, about 122 square kilometers uh, in surface. The geology of St. Helena is rather straightforward. It's a volcanic island that consists of two shield volcanoes. The red and orange in this little plot uh, show the older northeast volcano and the blue purple colors show the younger southwest volcano uh, that consists of three different shields, a lower shield, middle shield and an upper shield, um, which we all sampled in all these yellow spots where we gathered uh, lava flows. We sampled over 50 sites, uh, usually about five to 10 samples per site. And the flow thickness varied from about 20 centimeters to 10 meters. And where possible, we sampled uh, the bottom, middle and top of the flow. So before we dove into the paleo intensity experiments, we performed rock magnetic experiments. We created susceptibility curves uh, on the Kappa Ridge we performed uh, experiments on the VFTB, creating hysteresis loops and uh, IRM plots, and we performed VRM experiments. Here I'm showing uh, the susceptibility curves from all the successful sites. And you can see that even within all these sites that actually gave more than three, uh, three or more petty intensity results, the susceptibility cur curves give very uh, varying uh, ideas of the uh, rock mag within St. Helena. Um, yeah, that already gave us not the best hope for paleo intensity results, and they are actually quite hard to get. So we so far have only performed paleo intensity experiments on two localities, one from the mid shield of the younger volcano, Ladder Hill, uh, and one from the older volcano, Banks Valley. That's uh, the abbreviations are LH and VB, which is handy for the upcoming slides. And we performed a uh, thermal Izzy Tellier and microwave Izzy Tellier. And here's an overview of the selection criteria that I used for the paleo intensity experiments um, that we can, that uh, I'm showing later on as well. So let's start with the good results or okay-ish results. Here are the array plots from samples that uh, passed quite clearly our uh, selection criteria. Some are very straight lines, beautiful array plots, no viscous overprint and no alteration or hardly any alteration. Um, then there are some plots with a little bit of a too slopey behavior, but from the Zydervel plots, it becomes quite obvious that it is a, this is a viscous overprint that we're dealing with. Um, so yeah, there's definitely some results that I'm happy with. And when you look at the actual intensities that they produce, they are all relatively low or very, very low, like this five microtesla, eight microtesla, and then the highest in this plot. And in all, uh, most of them is 23 microtesla, where the field at St. Helena today is 29 microtesla. So we also have a lot of very bad results that I thought I would throw in there. Uh, yeah, almost laughable uh, slash sad, but let's move on quickly to the more interesting results or the ugly results as Michael has used them. Uh, the, these are uh, results that look like they shouldn't pass selection criteria, but they do. Like this Ladder Hill 10 site, which shows very zigzagged results, but does pass all selection criteria. In this case, we think that this is due to the big difference between the lab field of 20 microtesla and the ancient field that it's producing. 4.7 microtesla, and we were right when we reproduced the same uh, experiments, but with a lower lab field of 10 microtesla, we got the same results, but with a more beautiful um, Zyder, uh, array plot, which is shown in this figure two slides back. Um, but the most problematic sites are LH6 and LH13, which show very two slope uh, behavior very strong too slow behavior. And for instance, in this case, you could argue because of the Zyderfeld plot, 
that this is due to a viscous overprint, but in some cases the actual uh, steep slope passes the selection criteria, like here on the right, uh, which produces a field of 87 microtesla, uh, which is problematic to say the least, considering the other uh, samples produce a field of 10 or 20 microtesla. Um, so yeah, this is the case for LH6 and LH13, and uh, we're wondering if this is due to MD particles, multi-domain particles, um, or if, because of uh, viscous overprints. So we need to do more experiments and add PTRM tilt checks to our experiments. Uh, the microwave samples also don't show this, uh, so hopefully we can also create some more microwave experiments. However, the microwave is broken at the moment. Um, so for now, I've chosen to include all the all the samples, all the results uh, that pass the selection criteria. If I make the selection criteria stricter, I don't actually lose these and I do lose some of the values that I do trust. So that is not a solution, unfortunately. Um, here's an overview of the eight sites that we have so far that have uh, paleo intensities with an N of three or higher. And then you can immediately see that those two sites with the too slow behavior that sometimes give a very high intensity and sometimes very low have an incredibly high um, standard deviation that is almost as high as the, as the paleo intensity itself. Um, so yeah, we need to look into that where, where that comes from and do more experiments. But when looking at the other results, except for the oldest one, BV1, which is 27 microtesla, all the results are very low, 15 microtesla or lower. Um, which is interesting uh, and which could suggest that not only whether the directions are regular in the South Atlantic, but also the, the field was maybe weaker or recurringly weak. Um, a few things to note is that none of these sites show transitional directions in the uh, directional study that we published, even though the intensities are so low that you could su suggest or think that these are in transitional times. Uh, another thing is that these three sites give quite similar uh, paleo intensities. And we're also in direction so similar um, that we tested for serial correlation and they were used as one directional group. Um, yeah, again, we need more experiments with PTRM still checks to test for MD behavior. Um, and I have more sites that I can perform paleo intensity experiments on. Yeah, what does this mean for the field in the South Atlantic? Um, if we do include these very high intensities from ladder hill six and ladder hill 13 with the two slope behavior, that could mean that the field strength is varying highly, um, which would agree with the high dispersion in directions uh, that we published in PNES. Um, but if these insanely high intensities of like 80 microtesla are due to um, multi-domain behavior or overprints, and we would exclude them all the intensities that we're left with are overall very weak, uh, which could suggest that the anomalous behavior in the South Atlantic is actually caused by a referring, uh, recurring reversed flux patch, um, specifically on the Clemenza boundary. Our conclusions uh, is that St. Helena lava flows are not great for poly intensity experiments, but it is possible. Uh, in the flows that we do get good results for, we see very low intensities, down to five microtesla. Um, some flows we see extreme too slow behavior that can be interpreted as very low or very high intensities with the current set of selection criteria. This could mean either uh, very varying intensities were present or if we wouldn't exclude these too slow behavior uh, sites, we mainly see very low paleo intensities for St. Helena. Either way, the existence of the extremely weak paleo intensities give more evidence of the recurring anomalous behavior of the magnetic field in the South Atlantic on a million year time scale. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Excellent. Nice talk. Thanks very much for that. Um, I have a question, but I think I'll be the good convener and ask, does anyone else have a question first before I... Uh... Right, okay, that's it. Everyone else had a chance. I'm jumping in. <laughs> um, it's just a curiosity. Uh, BV1-1, 
the sample, the, the, the temperature versus susceptibility curve for that looks funky. It's like there's at least, what, three different minerals? Yeah. <laughs> it does look funky. And we have a lot of these funky susceptibility uh, curves with a lot of phases, a lot of titanium, uh, but then even phases with different amounts of titanium. And I, I do not have enough knowledge to interpret these in detail. Uh, I tried, I made like little prints of all the different susceptibility results that I had and tried to group them together. And it was almost impossible. We have so many different uh, behaviors, even within one site. That, yeah, it's just. Uh, yeah, on mixing the kind of temperature versus the susceptibility curves, and there's more than one phase in there is, is kind of tricky. It's one of the things that guys up here are working on. They're building, they're just running loads and loads and loads of minerals to try and make a library of them. But but PV11 one, one is is like what there's like definitely three different phases in there yeah. and you could kind of say maybe titan and magnetite for a couple of them but is it really that you have that many different phases of the same oxide in there probably not but but yet you're getting good data out of it yeah <laughs> which is interesting <laughs> which yeah. of those do you think is actually carrying that signal for you sorry Wh which of these phases do you think mm. is carrying the signal um, for BV1, I would have to dive into the actual right plots. I don't think I have any of them in here, but I should have them in a later. Oh, we can talk about it later. I, don't, yeah. it's not I mean, I would have to look at which component uh, I use to interpret it, obviously. But um, yeah, I, I don't know but from memory which component I use. Um, uh, does uh, perhaps Professor Williams, do you have a question for us? I do, yeah. I'm about to um, expose my ignorance of the geology, really. So I, it was a really nice uh, talk, actually, but I, I didn't quite uh, get the ultimate conclusion in terms of um, the prevalence of these uh, low shear velocity provinces or these reverse flux patch patches. And actually, if are, are they inconsistent with each other, those two conclusions? Um not necessarily, no. It's just that based on my previous uh, study of the directions, all we could say was there is some behavior on the core mental boundary, either reverse flux patches and normal flux patches um, alternating, or there's something going on. But if it was a weak field constantly and not an unstable field that is sometimes high and sometimes weak and averages out as a uh, GAD, uh, if it's mainly weak, then that would suggest a reverse flux patch is dominantly causing it. Okay. Yeah. And what is your what what is your best guess then? Oh, <laughs> well, to be honest, I do. Um, I obviously think about this a lot, but I'm not sure if I can use paleo intensities for this best guess yet, because I would need to convince myself a little bit more of these weak intensities first. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think there's a combination going on between the, uh, the LLSVP causing reverse flux patches, um, but maybe also something within the core in, in the circulation there, which Aubert talks about. Uh, there's, yeah, I think there's way more than one situation causing all this uh, anomalous behavior in the South Atlantic. Okay, more complicated than maybe we... Yeah, maybe. I think so. All right, that's great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. And I think Eduardo had a question, but took his hand down. No, it, it's been answered already. Thanks. Yeah, uh, maybe, do you have also like uh, some thermomagnetic remanence measurement? Yes. No, that's, okay. Yeah. Did I see the, the weather in the talk? Maybe I missed them. Okay. Yeah, focus. It was already so obvious to me anyway that the rock mag didn't necessarily show which we're going to get good paleo intensities that I st stuck to susceptibility. But um, usually, because I did both for one sample, I usually put like the same material uh, in the Kepler bridge and then sister sample in the VFDB. And okay. it would give very uh, similar plots. Perfect. Thanks. <laughs>